So Baskin, come on up here. I want to. Yes. So, in 1979, they introduced the world to the first hybrid amplifier that has, in my opinion, changed forever what we listen to today, certainly what PS Audio is producing. So, in honor of that, uh, we went out and bought two bottles of 1979. Oh, my God. Whoa. Uh, wine. <laughs> and because... Arnie is the wine aficionado. You get to choose. Do you want the French or the California? Um, well, <laughs> well, I, 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 Should we fight it out later? Yeah, we'll no. fight it out later. It's, it's fine. All right, so right now I'll give Bas Baskin's from California. Yeah, and you're going to drink it together? and I are going to drink both sure. of them anyway. Well, here you are, sir. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Woohoo! This could be really good. Thank you. Man, what a gift. Thank you. Yeah. And you had a question for Arnie or for... Well, both. I oh. wanted to know how did they get associated <coughs> for the first day? Oh, oh, well, oh well, well, that was simple. I was working in consulting for Infinity. Infinity. You know, I did a lot of work with Infinity over the years. I mean, all the servo electronics and all the electronics other than the switching amp uh, I was probably responsible for. Okay. And he had a, a Stax Class A amplifier in the sound room, which we really liked. It was about a 100 watt beautiful amp. And he said, well, let's, let's make one. Let's, let's, you know, and I said, oh boy, I know how to do it. <laughs> And uh, we did, you know, and, it w and we made it in the form of an erector set. It had a had a, a regular, regular old-fashioned chassis with a uh, with a, uh, a fan-cooled heatsink vertical on it, and that was the first iteration with separate power supplies. And then we built another level. We called, it <laughs> and we had solid-state plus and minus 300 volt supplies and everything to run that thing. And we and we took it to several shows yeah. and demonstrated the speakers with it. And then finally says, Baskin, you've got to you've got to make this amplifier. I said, Well I don't make amplifiers, I just design them. I don't know what to do, flap flap. But I had a good <laughs> I had a good I had a good friend Bob Day in Santa Barbara who was a very talented young guy with he had all kind of talents and we hired him to come in and, and do the packaging on it. And he did a, just a beautiful job on, on that. And also, he did all the logic of, uh, of the uh, sequencing and turn-on stuff. So we finally got, a, got a, a real amplifier out of it. But it was an interesting project to do that, though. It really was. You know? And what was interesting in all of the development work, we never blew an output transistor, ever. It just, and you could, you could put a 20-amp uh, power supply or, or AC fuse on the amplifier and just short it. Poop. You can also fry an egg on top. <laughs> yeah, well, no, actually, that amplifier had had two heat sinks, you know, one per channel, and they were up, they were dissipating 300 watts all the time. You know? All the time. Yeah, because that was that that amp was true class A up to clipping into an 8 ohm load, and it idled at three amps at plus or minus you know 52 volts. What amp was that? That was a hybrid class A. And that was the top no. color. That's what it was called. Yeah, an HDA, I think, was its acronym. Yeah. HDA. And, and Gordon Holt reviewed that one. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, obviously we didn't build it just like we didn't build the IRS to sell a bunch of them, although we, <laughs> we did sell a bunch of IRSs. So we didn't build this amplifier to, you know, to sell a bunch of them. We built it to see how good an amplifier could be. And uh, Infinity in its heyday, that is exactly what we did with almost everything. We wanted to see how good things could be because yeah. we were nuts. I mean, geez, <laughs> obviously <laughs> this is well. So, I uh, how could I talk about the amplifier? I mean, can I answer some spe specific questions? Yeah, I have a question. Could you speak up? Ask them. They can't hear you. Oh, okay, yeah. I'll speak up louder. Um, that was a Class A design and obviously has the drawbacks of a lot of wasted heat. That's right. A lot of wasted energy one way or another. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, but is seamless in terms of zero transitions. That's true. In today's technology, in this technology, what are the choices you made in terms of oh. class A versus A, B? Good question. Well, that's a real good one. And versus C or G or D or no. H. <laughs> no, it actually turns out to be class A, B. Uh, do I need this? No, yeah. I'll no. take it. Um, it actually turns out to be shockingly low class A, B. I mean, it's idling at about a quarter of an amp per, per phase. It's actually a two-phase bridge amplifier rather than a single phase. So that's why we can get this kind of power out of like 40 volt supplies instead of 80 volt supplies for a non-bridge. But uh, it turns out that the amplifier circuitry is very well balanced so that there's hardly any even harmonics. You think, well, any balanced amplifier, a push-pull tube amplifier shouldn't have evens, 
but a lot of them do because they're adjusted differently for various reasons. But this amplifier has got a very low amount of even harmonics, and they're mostly odds. Well, now I think if you look at some of the history of uh, the people's opinions about the sound of odd harmonics, you know, they could be nasty as opposed to nice sounding even harmonics. But this amplifier doesn't sound that way. Shocking in, in this regard. And, and that the idling power is so relatively low. But as it is, uh, it draws 150 watts AC off the line when, it, when it's uh, in operate state. And about 80 of that is in the heat sinks. And the rest of it is in uh, front end supplies and filament supplies for the tubes and just power supply losses. And it finally adds up to 150 off the line. Well, let me point out something. And that was a great question. Yeah, it was. And, you know, I think even between the two of us, can only give you a partial answer. But some of the answer has to do with the experience that all of us have had over many years. You know, it's very nice to, to you know, bias an amp up to be class A at full output, but that's very impractical. That has its own problems, by the way. That isn't perfect. Uh, some of the, these class A amplifiers, they sound very nice, but they have other problems with dynamics and things like that. Th so <coughs> most of the music that all of us listen to, okay, most of it is around one or two watts. I mean, that really is true. And the rest of it, you know, we need it for dynamics, okay? And this amplifier is fully class A to about one watt per channel. And, you know, it's hard to understand with all the music and all the, you know, all the swings of voltage and stuff, but most of the music is really contained, you know, unless you have a horribly inefficient loudspeaker, I mean, really inefficient, most of the music is in that one or so watts. What uh, kind of tubes are you using, and, and how, did you, how did you pick out the tubes, and are you hearing how much of an effect, I guess, do the tubes have on the sound, and have you listened to a lot of different tubes? Well, there came a, a time when we were talking about this tube idea for making this amplifier that we actually built up an experiment where we had the tube front end and here's here's just this thing added to it and it totally transformed what was the amplifier without the tubes well but you asked another part of the question and that was a very important part all of us involved including me went through a shit pile of tubes. Oh, I mean, right. th oh, these are 6922s or 6DJ8s, you know, basically the same two. We chose those because there are so many varieties of them, there are so many good ones. Uh, you know, we had to make sure that we could find a tube that would really do the amplifier justice because I mean, if, you're, if you know tubes, uh, you can put a tube in one circuit and it sounds pretty good, and you put it in another circuit, it sounds terrible. I mean, it's, that's just the way these things go. So, so the question was, how could we find a tube for that amplifier which totally complements it, and we can actually buy it? They're, they're being made. And, you know, after going through a whole bunch of NOS tubes, new old stock tubes, uh, till I couldn't even listen anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we came to a tube that you can buy. It's expensive, but you can buy it. It's being made now, and it truly complements that amplifier. Yeah, and that's and that's and how. It's not as expensive as some of the new old stock types. Oh, yes. And that's we right. also had experience with this particular type of, of 6922 genre, if you will, in some of our other things we're listening to in our preamps. And we, we like the 7308, so those are really good. You know, and uh, so we had this experience even prior to trying all the tubes out in this amplifier. Right. Yeah. Like 73, 7308s, the really good ones are about 100 bucks a piece. Yeah. So I noticed you made it though so that the tubes are accessible. Absolutely. So you expect and, and people to do tubes. They're going to roll tubes, <laughs> with, not, notwithstanding. I'd be shocked if they, if they did. <laughs> yeah. And the interesting thing is that, that, that you can plug any one of them in there, and it, it all comes to the same operating condition. Yeah, and exactly. it all work. Yeah. So, some people will choose an NOS tube and they'll put out as much money as it takes, 500 bucks a piece. I mean, that's not too rare. And they may want to put it in that amp and, it, and they may think it sounds great and more power to them. Look, I roll tubes all the time and a lot of people that play with tubes do the same thing. But I have to say, the ones that are in there really do complement the amp. Those, those, those are the uh, Gold Lion. Exactly. The ones that we're using. Really? Yeah. Gold Lion 6922 being made yeah, now in Russia. Russia. Mm -hmm. How much life do you expect to get out of, out of those 
those tubes. It depends how what what, what uh, manner of warranty you buy from us. <laughs> Oh, that's really good. That's good. I like that. Look, vacuum tubes have to be replaced. If, if for example, uh, you listen to music every day or every other day and you play it for a number of hours, my suggestion would be is, is certainly after a year, replace them. They're not that expensive. Not like what I have to pay every eight months. Well, one of, one of the things we did on this amplifier, um, which was an idea I think Bob, our chief engineer, came up with, was a button on the front, which is, if, I don't know if you can see, yeah. but that PS logo button on the front, if you press that, it turns the tube off, but leaves the amplifier on. Mm -hmm. So the MOSFETs stay warm, it reduces down, because it runs a little hot. Yeah, but it, it takes it, but it, it, takes it down, it keeps it warmed up and sounding good, and then when you want to actually listen, you turn that on, fire the tube up, and you're good to go. So that, that way you really save, extend the tube life. Yeah. Yeah. It really is the best of all worlds because many people think it takes hours for tubes to warm up, but it really takes longer for the solid state mm -hmm. part of that That's amplifier true. to come to thermal equilibrium. Yeah. The yeah. tubes in a half an hour sing pretty well, I have to tell you. So I, I have a quick question that I want to see if maybe Baskin can do a little drawing up there for us. and. and oh, you won't let me go. <laughs> <laughs> what was that crack? Oh, nothing. Oh, no. This amplifier uses what I referred to last time as sa same-sex devices. So most mm -hmm. amplifiers have full complementary outputs, um, and a P-channel, an N-channel, or an NPN. Bascom chose <coughs> to not do that, because over the years, I believe Bascom has found that using the same-sex devices um, causes the amplifier to sound very much different than using dual devices and maybe Bascom could kind of show us a little bit about the circuitry and explain uh, about that because I think that is very unique to this <coughs> amplifier. And maybe okay. why you don't like the p-channel device. Oh well that's, so. that's, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> well I made this little this here a little sketch here that looks like Greek of course but what it does show is the connection of two in-channel MOSFET power devices and they're sort of stacked on each other that this is a plus supply and a minus supply which is typical of all power amplifiers and this midpoint is where the load goes to the speaker well there are three ways of operating any three terminal device be it a tube transistor mosfet or a jfet and this and i'm going to use the acronym of a transistor which has a base an emitter and a collector if you operate it in a common emitter mode where the emitter is sort of grounded and you take the load off the collector that's called the common collector mode and that gives you gain and you have a fairly high output impedance but that's the way most amplifier circuits are if you sort of ground the collector and drive the base you get an emitter follower and that has the property of a gain of about one but it has a low output impedance for driving things and a high input impedance the final mode is to drive the emitter, which is called the common base mode. That's the most linear, and whatever current goes in almost perfectly comes out the other end. So this circuit actually is operating these devices in the common emitter mode to where they have gain. And this is different because most power amplifiers are operated with their outputs as emitter followers to get a low output impedance to start with. This circuit uh, actually has a fairly high output impedance to start with because both of these devices are going to be driven as common emitter amplifiers. Okay, but how do we get, if you look at the topology of, of this, if you drive this bottom one, there's no question that this emitter is practically grounded and the collector is the thing that's moving. Well, when you look at this one, the collector isn't moving, but this one's moving. How, how do we make this device act just like that one but we have to do that if we're going to get symmetry and the trick is we put a resistor of approximately 360 ohms between the gate drive and the output in the case of this device and the same thing the mirror image down here 3 point, 360 ohms is there for a specific reason because we drive 10 milliamps of current through it uh, when the thing is at idle and 10 milliamps for this one 
and that causes 3.6 volts of gate bias, which just happens to be what we want to turn these things on to. We bias them up to, let's say, at this quarter of an amp. So that's idle, and this is now sitting at zero volts. If we were to unbalance these two 10 milliamp sources by one milliamp each way, this goes up by one, and this goes down by one milliamp, we've now shifted the drive from these being equal, this one takes over and starts to drive the load. And we can continue to the point where this gets 20 milliamps, and this gets nothing, this one's completely cut off, and this one is now putting the full current into the load. And incidentally, that's the point in which class A stops. You can't get any more than, you, all you can do with this drive is double it and cut and make this one go to zero. Well, that's kind of interesting because you say to yourself, if I could only double this, and <clears throat> if these devices were perfectly linear, all I could do is to get this 250 mils to go to 500 mils, double it. Well, that's only a half an amp times eight ohms. That's not very many volts. That's not 40 volts. Well, the thing about it is that these devices have a, a rather strangely nonlinear characteristic, meaning that if we, if 3.6 if volts gives us oh, a quarter of an amp of current, if we were to double that, these things can suddenly put out 40 amps. So there's no question in, in driving this load all the way to the top, well, because when this becomes 20 milliamps, we've doubled this voltage gate drive, but doubling the gate drive makes the potential current go way the dickens up. So that's how this can be operated class AB. If these were linear devices, we'd have to run these things at, you know, for a plus or minus 40 volt supply and a, and a 200 watt amplifier would have to be running at a couple amps, you know, 200, 400 watts of heat. And you know, why do you think that that's better than having both P and N? Well, well, the circuit topology for P and N would be totally different. In other words, this, this is chosen to be this way. I mean, we are, we are running these, these, these uh, MOSFETs in this configuration. But you, there's something about you, this that's t that tells all of us that you don't, you don't like that P-channel device. Could you talk about that? Well, uh, when you use P-channel devices, and they do it all the time uh, in, in MOSFET amplifiers, the, there's something about the P-channel devices that, that International Rectifier makes that are the most dominant type that we find in the market today, if you make a simple amplifier out of them, and let's say you, I don't know, you just set it up as a, a grounded emitter amplifier, and how good is that amplifier? You find that it has a frequency response anomaly right in the middle of the audio range. From DC to maybe 500 cycles, it's got full gain, and then it falls off in, into about 6 dB less, and then it goes off flat beyond that. Well, when you put that in an amplifier, you get all kind of results from that anomaly. You know, the, uh, your frequency response isn't flat, and the distortion isn't flat with frequency. So it isn't a good complement uh, of those types. Now, it turns out that in this driver stage for this PS amplifier, the, well, somebody was going to ask, how is it different than Constellation's circuit? I can ask that. <laughs> <laughs> so the gain structure of the Constellation products is, is, is a little different, you know, as I, as I mentioned. But, but that's, that's, that's just one difference. But the output solid state circuit topology is very similar. But it doesn't use the same devices. One reason being that the uh, people that make the Constellation audio amplifiers bought up all of the good Renasis uh, uh, and uh, Hitachi MOSFETs. MOSFETs, and those those P-channel ones don't don't have that problem that I was mentioning. And some of the smaller ones by uh, uh, Supertex, little little ones, don't have that problem. It's only the IRF type power devices that have that problem that I was mentioning, okay, so, but the smaller signal, but we had to have, in the case of the driver tra transistors that are going to, what it really b boils down to is a differential amplifier of P devices that sits up against a higher voltage rail than 40 volts, and their drains come down to these points. So the second stage of, of this kind of a circuit is a P-channel differential stage. And that is direct coupled from an N-channel input stage. So it's like a N-channel diff amp, P-channel diff amp, and these for outputs. And that's, that's true in both of these, these, these products. 
However, the devices that we're using in, in, the, in this product are, are quite different. Well, why don't you explain a little bit about the CAS code, sir? <coughs> yeah, okay. And, and, and Good point. Why, why well, use the CAS codes? Okay. How did you solve the higher output impedance issue? Ah, now that uh, requires global feedback. Yes, uh, absolutely. Right. And, and he has. And, and the output impedance ends up by being about a tenth of an ohm. <coughs> mm -hmm. A tenth of an ohm, you know, 0.08 ohms, damping factor close to 100, which is, which is a good number. But that's what it takes. No, you have to. And, and how much global feedback ended up being it's applied? Or in the order of 40 dB. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you have to do that with this. And by the way, some of the early transistor amplifiers that came out had a interstage transformer uh, that would couple to uh, same-sex output devices, and they, and they drove those transistors from base to emitter. So they were common emitter high impedance outputs also, and they had to have feedback in their circuits to get the output impedance low. But it all, but it all works. You know, it turns out that I came, I saw this topology like 30 plus years ago. Uh, in the form of a Yamaha B2 power amplifier. That was a, I, I did a lot of reviewing for Audio Magazine over the years, and that, that was one of the amplifiers that I had. When I saw that circuit, I said, oh, this is really different. Oh, look at this, you know, this is cool. And uh, the amplifier sounded good. I studied that circuit, and another friend turned me on to a um, Spectrosonics mixing console um, gain amplifier, and lo and behold, there was that circuit again with, with bipolar transistors. Mm. You know, and I said, that's very interesting. So, uh, Bongiorno and I uh, talked about all that kind of stuff because we commiserated on circuits all the time. And, we, and I made a little Class A amplifier out of that, where it's a differential amp input stage of transistors, a second stage of transistors, and a couple of really fast output devices that Bongiorno gave me, they were like gold stud-mounted parts that were, had good, you know, FT. And it was about a 35 watt a channel amplifier, and here was this high impedance output stage with feedback. Oh, it had great bass. Wasn't any problem with it. It sounded really good, you know? So I said, <coughs> so how did this all come to consolation? I was, when I was commissioned to make the first power amplifier or for them, but that's what they approached me for was to do a power amp. I was trying, I was gonna actually use a driver transformer <laughs> with a pair of MOSFETs like that. And I was fooling with it. I had a good Lundahl transformer. They make really good ones, but oh, no way could I get feedback around that happily at all. I said, that's, that's it. I can't do it. And then it just sort of hit me as an epiphany. You know what would be really killer is that old circuit what with all MOSFETs. That was the, was the vision. Oh my God. Whoa. Okay. So I started to work on that. And I realized that the old circuits that, that I made had to be Class A, but, but the MOSFETs and these characteristics that they had, they didn't have to be. And I had a, a stereo breadboard going in, I don't know, maybe a couple of days, you know, maybe 50 watts a channel, and I'm shit, this sounds pretty good in my setup. And I had Peter Madnick from DTG and the guys from Neil Fay who made all the metal work. They came to my house, and we're playing this thing, and they say, whoa, this is really great, and boom, off we went. You know, and that very tr quickly translated to a Hercules power amp. It was much bigger, and then off that whole story went. And it was really uh, pretty exciting. But uh, this is more exciting, you know, because I get to put my name on it, and I get to have one, and it sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am delighted as I get one first. No, I already <laughs> have one. <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and Arnie, what? your yours is here. I know. So yeah. here. I know. No, how, about, how about we do two more, two more questions, and then we'll we'll yeah. Because so we don't uh, drag on yeah, too long. Because we could talk for, and then of course we can sit and talk with Bascom afterwards. Yeah, it turns out I have one of the three prototypes. That that's the one that I did a lot of work on to make work the way I wanted to. I mean, this is circuit boards are pretty chewed. Yeah, but they finally sent me metal work and I cobbled it all together and I'm not giving it up for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed music enormously well, and with it. One of the things that we insisted upon, um, and because Bascom wanted it, and we struggled with it, I think you might have read that, is that it's all through hole um, using the very expensive dollar a piece PRP resistors and um, poor, poor Bob, our chief engineer, how to make the boards and the people who have to assemble it. Uh, were put into panic mode because part of the problem is today 
there are very few board houses that can do through hole construction anymore. Right. This is all hand done, all hand soldered and, and put into place. And it, it seemed like when Bascom said, I got to have it, we said, yeah, sure, no problem, you know. <laughs> and then to go out and try and find someone to manufacture this was a real nightmare. But our, our, our hero, Bob Stadler, our chief engineer, put it all together and made it work. And yeah. Bascom approved it. And, and boy, does it work. And boy, does it work. Yeah. Um, anybody else have a question they want to? You're mentioning Casco. I did mention Casco. Yep, okay. Here's an interesting thing. I was talking about these various modes of operation of devices. If you take a common emitter type of a circuit and then run its collector into the uh, emitter of a device above it, that's called a cascode. Well, if you take a really a nice little MOSFET like the VP series of Supertex as the bottom device, which is really good, and put the lousy PNP on top of it, it behaves, when you measure it, just as good as a little guy. It did, and that's what we had to do in the driver stage of this design, is we used these small devices cascoded with, with some P-channel IRF types, you know, the ones that have this, this I issue, and it completely takes that out of it. And I was really worried. I had to do that to make it work, and I was really worried that it might not sound as good. Oh, that might not sound as good. Oh, ring, ring. Or I was saying it's going to sound good, it's going to sound good, and it did. No noise problems? With oh, not, not at that point in the circuit. Yeah. No, not at that point in the circuit. As a matter of fact, people do cascodes as input stages a lot, too. You know, like <coughs> people will use a, a, a JFET, let's say, for an input stage with a tube on top of it to get the lower noise of the JFET. So a cascode is, is a good idea. And... Uh, John Carl uses it a lot. The the Constellation Audio's phono preamp is a it's a John Carl circuit par excellence. It's really a very uh, exotic circuit with cascoding, <laughs> JFETs and MOSFETs. Talking about amplifier topologies, there's another one which I don't think has a letter designation that I think was originated by Leak in the UK, and that's to use a small class A amplifier five or ten watts and effectively put current boosters for the oh, dynamic sure. parts of this the is true. music this either is side of the, uh, the provide positive or negative current and there's a Marantz that I possess that uses that same topology it seems to have disappeared and I wondered whether well it's, a, it's your, a your Marantz disappeared or the technology? No, no, <laughs> no. Oh, okay. No, I, that's, I a, that's, a, know that's a great idea. You, you know who, you know who has the best modern uh, implementation of that is De Villiers. Those okay. circuits, they have a Class A amplifier with a switching amplifier on the same output line, yeah. and that works really good. But yeah. that would be a, a totally different circuit design approach than, than what this tr was and the way I went with it. Yes, I wondered whether whether you considered it or... Uh, no, I, I didn't. No, I went straight with, as soon as I had that epiphany, if you will, I went straight with that and um, to that end result. Anybody else? Yeah. No questions? How much? <laughs> Thirty-nine ninety-five. Yeah. Today and today only, uh, the, the, the amplifier in the U.S. is $7,500. Which, if you consider what it's being compared against, is is a, and it'll be available in mono blocks for the same price, or stereo. So the mono is basically everything that you get in the stereo. We just take one of the tubes out and call it a mono amp. So you get double the amount of output transistors, and that's and that's what. Um, as soon as production finishes up, I'm going for two, a pair of mono blocks in in the music room one. Yeah. But what you meant was seventy-five hundred dollars each for the mono block. Yes, seventy-five hundred each. Oh yeah, oh, that'd be a great deal. Let's rewind the tape. You said seventy-five hundred. Anybody else for Baskin? All right. Well, then we can go take a listen. All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. McGowan. Dr. Goodell, you did great. Thank you.